everyone, welcome back to UniX TCG, and we're going to start off the top of this week with some One Piece discussion, One Piece card game discussion. And uh, that discussion is going to be mainly focused around the leader, Kinemon. So basically, a lot of people really like the Whitebeard Wilden video I did, so I actually want to talk about another one from a different angle, and that's Kinemon. Um, basically, I feel like he is the law of set two. I'm going to get into what I mean by that in a moment, but I real quick wanted to say that uh, if you are a fan of the channel and want to figure out ways to support me and this endeavor in free ways, you could just go over, like the video, make sure you hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, uh, click the notification so you never miss a beat, and uh, yeah, you could also join me in other avenues like Discord, the Twitter, which I post a whole bunch of stuff, not only just for the channel, but like anime and just cool personal stuff as well, uh, the Instagram for the channel, things like that. All sorts of ways you can just join a part of Universe X. But with that being said, I do want to jump into the whole subject matter of this, and I can also tell you that uh, if you're watching today, make sure you check out the channel for some more Battle Spirits Saga gameplay. We're doing a couple card games around here and some video games on Twitch. We'll be going live today as well, so yeah, links to all that will be in the description. So let's hop into it. So some of you may ask, what do you mean by the law of set two? Because that's not necessarily a negative connotation. Law's a very good deck, Kinemon's a very good deck, and the thing that I mean by this is that uh, we've started to see very much so that the game over in Asia is, the meta tends to be played a lot differently than the game here in the global side of things. On the global side of things, we tend to lean much more on aggression. Uh, we utilize the rush keyword a lot more than the other ones. Uh, the other uh, decks that were being played in the meta over in Asia, uh, they tend to like the interactions that maybe are a little more lofty, maybe take a little bit more setup, but come out pretty much like pretty cool. And that's why you saw like over there, Law being one of the most dominant decks in set one. Whereas when it came over here, we realized that with a fair amount of tuning, most decks could compete with Law very, very easily. Not saying the law always lost. Law definitely came away with some dubs, came away with lots of tops. But there's a lot of things that have to go right for a law to high roll somebody. Uh, not only have to draw a bunch of low drops, not their high drops off early, their searchers like their Nami's and their Bonnies, but they also have to not fall prey to, you know, the jet pistols, uh, Robin resolving. Uh, they had to not get Nekamamushi'd and uh, Okiku'd and uh, all these things. Their board had to be fairly protected. Even Kaido could potentially stabilize and start making sure their board never gets high enough for them to start using their effects. And I mean this to talk about Kinemon because in a lot of ways, it feels the same way. Over in Japan, uh, One Drop Zoro became the most targeted deck in the format. And I noticed that when you looked at lots of these lists, Sometimes the only rusher that one drop Zoro was playing was three drop Zoro. Uh, it was actually pretty crazy. Like they used Whitebeard nine cost for the top end. Uh, they end up using you know a lot of one drops to go off each other. The Magras, the uh, Machinos, the Sunny Coons, and then the Nami's are already in there. The Curlated On searching out all of those. They had a lot of stuff to go off of, and because um, most of their two Ks were all almost all their two Ks were Straw Hats outside of the uh, Otamas and the. Um, Machinos, they were able to use Curly to Dawn to pick up key swinging pieces, key boosting pieces, and 2Ks for defense. So the deck was able to go hard with it. But with a lack of rusher, seeing as that back in uh, set one, any average red deck would normally be playing four Zoros, four Luffy's, and potentially even copies of Sanji, maybe even Shanks too. So with less rushers in the deck, when it came to the matchup of Kinemon versus Zoro in set two, Kinemon was able to tap down and attack most of the threats Zoro could put down up until Whitebeard. You know, you put a Sunny Coon on board, it's gone. You try to stick a Robin, it's gone too. You had a lot of ways for Kinemon to stop that. But in America, global more like, you know, Europe, the Americas, you are actually seeing more Zoro players play their three copies of Luffy's on top of playing, you know, their three to four copies of Zoros. And what this means is there's more rush and in a format with more rush, once again, that is probably at this point the best keyword skill in the game, 
you can't quantify your opponent's board as long as they have a hand because they could play a card that can immediately swing. And that advantage is where Keenan starts to falter off. When it starts getting a high rolled red hand, that's going to be where it starts losing its momentum. Now, the whole thing about Keenan, though, let's actually start with that. The leader effect is good. It shines in two places when you're establishing board and when you're coming back from your board being deestablished. I don't think that's a word. Yeah, I think that's a word. Sorry, it's a little late or early, depending on what time you think 4.44 a.m. is. The point is, um, what I'm like trying to say here is that when your board is at zero, he's at his most dangerous. Uh, in the early game, you're setting up Okiku's a turn early, a head on curve, you know? You are playing things like um, things like Rizos ahead of curve. You're playing the four drop Yamato's ahead of curve. If you want to establish it, you can play the five drop Yamato ahead of curve. All these things are cool. Or when your board gets heavily mitigated and you're coming back to reestablish, you're playing Odin's for two. Or sorry, Odin's for seven. You're playing Okiku's again for two. And you move on from there. So the thing about this is when you're in a stabilized position, Keenaman doesn't do much for itself as a leader. Uh, when you're in an established position with two blockers and two good threats and a searcher, he's a vanilla leader. He got you there, and you're stabilizing off the back of green as a card color, but he is a vanilla leader at this point. And that is going to be where lots of advantage can kind of falter. Yes, you can ride off the back of this established field, but once that field starts taking damage, there's like a little sweet spot where you have three characters and your opponent is fully capable of defending themselves, but you're not capable of using your leader effect, so you're essentially a man down. You're an effect down per turn. Now, the other thing about this is that Kinnaman is a very, very tight deck because to make that momentum happen, you have to make sure that you're playing key copies of certain cards. Like, for instance, um, back during the kid days, Okiku could have been a four of, sometimes Okiku was a three of. Went back and forth depending on how you felt. But in this deck, has to be a four of because you want to open up with this card every single game, okay? Now, next, you got this card, Yamato. Four drop Yamato, tap something six or less. Again, this card can be played for three, it's got excellent stats, it's a Yamato, which means it's an Odin in name, which means it turns on your blockers like Toki, and this is very, very, very good, okay? So you're gonna be running four of these because once again, you wanna see these as often as possible to tap down your opponent's board, be able to swing on things they didn't want you to swing on. Um, you wanna have it in the early game too because it's the perfect follow-up play to Okiku. Um, when you play Okiku on turn one and then you follow up with turn two Yamato and tap something else, you're gonna put the Don under Okiku, swing with it at the uh, character that this tapped only to then, you know, tap something else, which then you can bring in your leader to come in and swing on. So you've got that cascading effect that kind of screams tempo with control splashed in. So you have to run maximum pieces of cards you want like that. Throw in more cards like one of the best bosses in the game, Odin. He's going to come in. He's going to be able to swing twice. Amazing card. And he gives you back some, like, insurance when he gets killed. Uh, you also have cards like this that have been very popular in Kinnaman decks because he's a big body blocker. It takes normally two cards in conjunction to clear him. He can swing and defend. Great, great threat. Great, great defense. Um, and those are cool. But if you want to notice something about all those, none of them have counter cost. None of them. None of them have counter cost. So you have these type of things. Um, and then when you go through the deck, you have other cards that, of course, don't have countercoffs as well, which is like beige, you know, you have your Punk Gibson, which, of course, you cannot be tapped out for, and then it's great. But if you're tapped out, or you see it, uh, if you're tapped out, or you have to make a play that taps you out, that card becomes at least dead until you can untap. Now, you look at the cards that uh, do have counter, right? And there's very few ones that you want to find expendable. Um, once we're first and foremost, we're going to talk about the biggest offenders of not expendable, and those are going to be your searchers. 
your searchers are you're gonna find yourself hard pressed to ever like you know drop those you're gonna feel bad every time you have to counter with one of these so those cards sometimes will have you clinging okay then you have your blockers uh most notorious ones of course are going to be one that you can't counter with one that you can but it's a cheap blocker that's turned on by one of your stickiest bodies as well as the four drop yamato so this is going to be a card that again you feel a little bad chomping with but in a format with vista running around in four and most of the top decks you don't always want to get caught lacking behind a lobby blocker which brings us to our next guy killer again he used to be a king now he's very very rough to use because red will look at him and be like oh you put a dawn underneath him dummy and they'll blow it up so you're already looking at quite a lot of the cards that make up this deck that you don't really want to pitch uh when it comes to 2ks you've got scratch on the poo which will always be a defender you don't ever use this effect and you've got Ezo, and Ezo, he's pretty good as an effect and as a 2k so sometimes you do have to choose which one you want to use this for um what i'm basically trying to explain is that the economy for defense is a lot worse in my opinion than it was with kid kid had so many flex spaces but at the end of the day kid himself as a leader could carry himself into the late game therefore there were a lot of times where sometimes you could just a lot weird spaces to things like beppo you know just additional 2ks additional counter you were able to play quite a lot of things without counter you know seven drop kids your eight drop kids your laws your uh basils your beige blocker but you also had a whole bunch of counter power as well as the ability to play additional counter power like beppo um i found in my practice with kinnaman that if you control that momentum, like if you open up and your curve is absolutely airtight, if you're turn one-ing into Okiku, but then you're turn two-ing into Yamato and just completely erasing their board, and then you get to five Dawn and you're able to, you know, put more under Okiku, you know, get some searcher going, you know, maybe even play a blocker, and then you're on your seven Dawn play and you play kid blocker and, you know, your eight Dawn play or your nine Dawn play and you're able to play Odin with still having Paradise Waterfall up, you can get into some positions where it feels like the momentum is just so strong, your opponent can't play a battle or a character card without it getting destroyed. Your opponent can't make a move without you having the instant clap back the following turn. Yes, these are possible. But in a format full of decks that just rush, 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 and then defend themselves very well against one to two swings per turn, Kinnaman is finding his time in the format to be a little more contested than he was in the asian metagame he's actually still one of the most represented decks in the game in our format however the conversion rate isn't as strong nearly as strong as what people thought it would be before um in fact it's sheer numbers are the reason why it has as many places as it could in any top cut and you're looking at decks that at one point now Whitebeard's way more prevalent but at one point Whitebeard wasn't even the most de or the deck most played and it was still making a better conversion rate seeing sometimes the same amount of slots in there um as Kinnaman now don't get me wrong I think that uh, Kinnaman is very 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 consistent and that consistency shows in how many times you'll see it in these top cuts how often you'll see it overrepresented in a meta because the deck does similar things every single game two one drop searchers draw in the form of Rizo, odin being a great boss card to close out games on his own getting something and shuffling your deck okiku and yamato just carrying early games on their back alone he's still great However, I do think that he is what I was discussing in that consistency versus explosiveness video. He is the definition of consistency. His explosive is nowhere near what you'd consider explosive in a red deck, you know? However, or even a purple deck sometimes, but when it comes to his general utility, you're tapping things down, you're attacking twice, you even have a little bit of destruction form of x drake or killer if you choose to play him so i do think that kinnaman is still a very 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 good deck but i do think that he is as i said before the law of this format much 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 worse than we thought i said much a bunch of times he's he's worse not as dominant as we thought he would be going into set two but he's still a very good leader, and you cannot afford to not know how to play against green in general, as well as Kinnaman. So, 
yeah just short discussion video let me know what you guys think in the comments um if you like other card games make sure to watch out for battle spirit saga i'll be playing uh i'll be doing a match with commentary on that later today and uh i'll also be going live for Mega Man battle network the uh hd legacy collection i said hd because i like throwing words in there uh you can find my twitch down in the description too so thank you guys and i'm gonna have a quick word from our sponsor mystic tcg and I hope you guys have a great day. See you in the next video. Later. So let's talk about Mystic TCG, your one-stop shop for all your TCG needs. On the site, you can buy or pre-order plenty of sealed product for plenty of games. Just make sure though, if you're pre-ordering, to give it three to four months in advance to start looking because sometimes the product is indeed hot, supply and demand, you know? And then if you wanna buy singles, go on tcgplayer.com. There's gonna be a link in the description where you can buy for the best value. And if you want to sell cards or collections, you can message them on their Facebook site so you can get the best bang for your buck on any type of way you wanna buy or sell cards. And then while you're at it, you can use the code UNIXTCG at checkout to get even more of a discount. So hey, what are you waiting for? Check out Mystic TCG today.